a star college running back with a long history of allegations of on-campus sexual assault and violence against women. I just kept crying and saying no. I remember just looking at him and he just looked like he wasn't there. And what exactly does she say? She said she had all that say. How many times did she say that during the night? Remember? Every three. The university knew of these multiple allegations, yet allowed the player to remain on campus. I just screamed and yelled and said, this is what happened to me. He's a football player. And he continued to play while the school failed to conduct a federally mandated investigation. Why did this happen? How is this happening? I was in shock. I was in absolute shock. <laughs> it's so awful. They knew what he did. <laughs> they knew what he did to me, and they did nothing. And then they allowed him to do it to another girl. <laughs> Today, Outside the Lines, the victims of inaction. And now, reporting for Outside the Lines, Bob Lee. This morning, we return to the University of Missouri, where the community's support of Michael Sam, even before he came out nationally, was celebrated as a model of understanding. This is also where, five months ago, we reported on the long-standing student cheering section that routinely goes beyond the bounds of decency. And this is the university where, in January, outside the lines recounted the school's inaction over the rape of a swimmer who later took her own life. Following our report, the school was criticized for its failures by an independent investigator. And today, the story of a star football player accused of sexual assaults by two different women and a physical assault by two others, allowed to remain on campus and on the field. Campus sexual assault is a hot-button national issue. Federal law requires schools to investigate the circumstances around such assaults. Last month, bills were introduced in Congress to up the penalties against non-compliant schools. Federal investigators are probing Florida State's handling of the allegations which were not prosecuted against Heisman winner Jameis Winston. Colleges across the country stand accused of inadequately responding to reports of sexual assault in many cases by athletes. And now this case at Missouri. An important note, this report contains explicit descriptions of sexual activity. Parents may wish to consider whether this is appropriate viewing. Now Paula Levine with the story of the victims of inaction. So give me, give me two tasks for him, one for today and one for tomorrow and times that you need him. It's race day. Her phone keeps no ringing, boy, but right? Teresa Breckel has it under control. Okay. Well, I'll tell him to go there then. All right, so he's in the there. On an April morning in her hometown of Winston-Salem, North Carolina, Breckel is helping organize an annual bike race. But being here was never her plan. Four years ago, she was a newly minted University of Missouri graduate with a bright future. Then, in the early morning hours of June 19, 2010, she was asleep in her bed in this apartment complex near campus. I had closed the door but had not locked it. And then the next thing I woke up to was, was Derek sexually assaulting me. Derek was football player Derek Washington, Missouri's star running back. Breckel fled to this nearby parking lot and called her parents. I just screamed and yelled and said, this is what happened to me. He's a football player. Why did this happen? How is this happening? I was in shock. I was in absolute shock. And I thought no one would, no one would believe me. But what Breckel didn't know was that Derek Washington already had a documented history of violence against women at Missouri. An outside the lines investigation has revealed that numerous university officials knew about previous incidents and failed to protect Breckel and other potential victims. Derek told me all about how he was going to be the best football player ever, how he was such a big deal. And this former Missouri student, who we'll call Jess, agreed to speak to Outside the Lines on the condition that we not reveal her identity. 
She says she first met Washington in 2007, almost three years before the incident with Teresa Breckel. In the fall of 2008, the Tigers were undefeated, ranked third in the country, and Washington led the nation in scoring. Washington, touchdown Tigers! After a tough loss to Oklahoma State in mid-October, Jess says she and Washington were hanging out in her dorm room. She says they had been friends, but that particular evening turned intimate. We started kissing, making out, and then he started fingering me. And that was about as far as I was willing to go. And so then he said, you know, let's have sex. And I said, no, nah, you know that I don't do that. You know that I'm not comfortable with that. She says she consented to oral sex with Washington that night, but when he pressed her to go further, she refused. And then he got on top of me, and that's when I was like, what are you doing? Like, knock it off. Get off of me, and... You said no. Yes, I said no. Like, don't do that. Get off me. And I went to push him off of me, and he grabbed both of my wrists with one hand and just proceeded to put his penis inside of me, and... I just kept crying and saying no. I remember just looking at him and he just looked like he wasn't there. Finally, he stopped and realized that I was, I was crying. I was so upset. And when I was finally able to push him off me, he just kept saying, if I said anything, they would kick him off the football team. And so if I said anything, he would kill me and then kill himself. So he threatened to kill you? Oh, yeah. Four days later, concerned about a vaginal cut, she went to the student health center and eventually acknowledged she'd been raped. They just kept asking me, who did this to you? I had some kind of gash on my neck. I had bruises on my wrists. I looked beat up, and I refused to tell them who did it because I was really freaked out. The lady from the women's shelter convinced me that I should come forward and tell the police who hurt me in case he was going to hurt other people. So six days later, Jess reported the incident to campus police and named Washington. They opened a forcible rape investigation and brought him in for questioning. Do you have any idea why I'm wanting to talk to you today at all? Mm -mm. Outside the lines obtained Washington's videotaped interview with Detective Sam Easley. And what exactly does she say? She said she don't have sex. Okay. How many times did she say that during the night? Remember? Maybe three. But Washington, who declined comment for this story, told Easley they did have intercourse that night. Well, how long it was your penis inside of her before she said stop? About 30 seconds, man. And then she said stop, and then I stopped. And she started crying. Okay. Was she ever, like, trying to push up on your chest at all or anything? When you were... What I'm getting at, Derek, is do you acknowledge that what happened shouldn't have happened? Yeah, it shouldn't have happened. It shouldn't do you acknowledge that what happened could be possibly considered to be an assault of some sort? No. Okay. After his investigation, Easley stated he had probable cause to believe a rape had occurred. Washington's parents told Outside the Lines that football coaches met with them about the incident and indicated that charges likely wouldn't be filed. And as it turned out, the prosecutor opted for a deferred prosecution agreement which meant he would not charge Washington if he had no contact with Jess and took rape awareness classes. No matter what happened with the police or prosecutor, it was right then the University of Missouri was legally bound to act to make sure Jess felt safe here and to protect other students. The federal law, part of Title IX, requires colleges do their own investigation into reports of sexual violence and to assess the needs of victims separate from the criminal process. Even though multiple university officials knew of Jess's rape allegation, including her academic advisor and some football coaches, it's not clear whether any of these officials told the Title IX coordinator. But Outside the Lines has confirmed there was no Title IX investigation. 
During that 2008 season, Derek Washington never missed a game and scored 19 touchdowns. One former athletic department employee who says she had no idea Washington was accused of sexual assault was Teresa Breckel, who had tutored him while she was a student. On that June night in 2010, nearly two years after Jess's rape allegation, Breckel was living here with a woman who was friends with Washington. That night, her roommate told her he would be stopping by. So I say, well, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and go to bed. I have to be at work tomorrow morning. I had closed the door but had not locked it. And I woke up to Derek digitally penetrating me. I mean, it was, it was terrifying. I think by the time I, I realized what was going on, I tensed. And then Derek left the room. And I can't describe the level of fear that I felt. I mean, I've never felt that scared in my whole life. Breckel says when Washington assaulted her with his finger, it was especially traumatizing because she was a virgin. I had made a choice to live my life a certain way. And then all of a sudden, one night, someone took that away from me and wasn't given permission to come in. And I didn't want him to come in. But there he was, assaulting me. <laughs> it was so awful. They knew what he did. <laughs> They knew what he did to me and they did nothing and then they allowed him to do it to another girl. <laughs> Later that day, Breckel went to the hospital where a sexual assault exam was performed. She filed a campus police report and obtained a restraining order against Washington. Then she left Missouri. I was terrified. I thought that Derek was going to come after me. I moved home. It was time for me to just kind of close the shutters and be by myself and to try to feel safe and to cope with what had happened. It took a lot for me to come forward, a lot. It just makes me wonder how many other girls there are out there that never said anything. As it turns out, other women did report violent behavior by Washington. Early in the morning on May 6, 2010, six weeks before Breckel's assault, a Missouri women's soccer player got into a fight at this bar with Washington's girlfriend. The soccer player told police that during the scuffle, Washington walked up and struck her with a closed fist on the left side of her face. After both women were arrested, the soccer player told police she wanted to press charges against Washington and a warrant request was issued for assault in the third degree but she returned later that day and told police she had changed her mind. This is her narrative from her talking to the detective and she stated that her coach made her feel as though she would not have any problems with her scholarship if she declined to prosecute Derek Washington for assaulting her. She stated that her coach said her scholarship would be fine if the incident stayed out of the news. <laughs> she had thought about the situation and she decided she wanted to decline prosecution on Mr. Washington. I mean, that, that's disgusting. That a coach told her or encouraged her to not move forward with charges. You're allowing this student to just keep doing what he's doing and he keeps hurting more girls. I don't understand how they can live with themselves. While campus police were investigating Washington for Breckel's sexual assault, he was named a captain of the football team. Head coach Gary Pinkle later suspended Washington a few days before he was arrested for felony deviant sexual assault. But the school allowed him to stay on campus. Thirteen days later, while Washington was out on bail, police were dispatched to this apartment complex. He was arrested again this time for allegedly beating up his ex-girlfriend. According to the police report, there was blood on her and all over the apartment. She told the officer he had tried to push her eyeballs into her skull and that he had assaulted her more than five times during their relationship. Four police reports. Four documented allegations of violent acts against women in less than two years. 
It was then that Derek Washington left the university. Six men and six women on the jury deliberated for two and a half hours and found Washington guilty of deviant sexual assault. In September of 2011, jurors convicted Derek Washington of sexually assaulting Teresa Breckel. He was sentenced to five years in prison, but was released after four months as part of a first-time offenders program. Both women waived privacy laws to allow officials at the University of Missouri to speak with outside the lines about their cases. But President Tim Wolf, former Chancellor Brady Deaton, Athletic Director Mike Alden, head football coach Gary Pinkle, and Title IX coordinator Noel English all declined to be interviewed. The school's so worried about protecting themselves. What about the victims? All of us should have been the last one. When you experience something like what I have and what these other women have, you really have an understanding of what the system is like. It's as dirty as everyone says. Paula Levine reporting. Now, after Derek Washington served five months in prison, he enrolled at Tuskegee University. He played his last season of college football there two years ago. In the spring of last year, Washington worked out for the NFL Chiefs and the Patriots, but neither team signed him. He is currently a registered sex offender, and according to his Twitter account, he's still enrolled at Tuskegee. After Outside the Lines first reported this story online on Thursday, Derek Washington told the St. Louis Post-Dispatch that he believed head coach Gary Pinkle and all Missouri coaches knew about that 2008 alleged rape, and that was recounted by the silhouetted woman in our report. And again, Washington was not charged in that incident. And in fact, that was the reason that Gary Pinkle did not suspend or otherwise discipline Washington six years ago. Pinkle dismissed a prominent Mizzou player earlier this year over an alleged assault by the player on his girlfriend, an assault that also was not prosecuted. But Pinkle says he had additional confidential information in this year's decision to dismiss. Six years ago, he allowed Washington to remain on the team. When we find out that uh, they did not press it, have any charges, then, uh, you know, that's it's I, I, I do make all my decisions about information I get and, and I can't go and call the victim up. You know, I can't, I'm not, I'm not, not legally can do that, and you wouldn't do that. Uh, but it's all about the information. And when the police get involved, then certainly they are investigators. They're professionals. That's what they do. And if they decide uh, that they're not going to press charges, um, then I'm not going to remove a player from the team for that. I just won't, I won't do that. It's not consistent with how I've handled any situation I hadn't been here before. So while Pinkle knew of the police investigation and the prosecutor's decision to not pursue charges, the police report clearly states the investigating detective believed there was probable cause to conclude Washington had raped a woman known as Jess in our report. And then there was the 2010 incident in which a Mizzou female soccer player was arrested, as was Washington's girlfriend, after a fight in which Washington struck the player. The female soccer player told outside the lines that her coach said the player would not have a problem with her scholarship if she did not bring charges against Washington. University Chancellor Bowen Lofton on Thursday said that incident has been investigated, the school concluding it was simply a misunderstanding. Athletic Director Mike Alden also addressed this. The outside review, as I said, did not substantiate that there was a, um, a, a situation where uh, scholarship was going to be in jeopardy based upon uh, what had taken place. Um, and for our former soccer player, um, we, know, we know that her, so her scholarship was never in jeopardy. She was a post-eligible student athlete. We know that she finished her uh, degree here at the University of Missouri on scholarship. So what we do know in that review, though, was that it wasn't able to substantiate that. But the soccer player involved tells Outside the Line she was informed by the university that her scholarship was being revoked and only the intervention of an attorney resulted in her remaining on scholarship at the University of Missouri. And now with all of that as background, we say good day to Kate Fagan of ESPNW.com. And the headline over her current piece, why athletic departments are clueless about handling sexual assaults. Kate, it's good to have you here. Why are they clueless? I think the main reason here is the culture that we grow within athletic departments. I mean, these are places that end up looking like little mini nation states. You know, mascots, flags, anthems, all that stuff that athletes rally around and coaches and administrators within that space rally around that too. And so when one of their own, whether it's a football player, a, 
or any other athlete has an accusation against them, regardless of the protocols that may be in place, there's still a human reaction that occurs when one of your own is attacked. And a lot of times what happens is the closing ranks. And so I think, you know, in Claire McCaskill's report, her congressional report that said that 20% of cases on college campuses that involve student athletes are handled by athletic departments, there's just an inherent conflict of interest because we are talking about administrators who are charged, one, with the welfare of student athletes, but also with a big money product. And a lot of times it's tough for them to balance that. So I think it's a combination of that culture and also the money. You talk about money, you talk about revenue sports inevitably, and here, of course, we focused on Missouri and a revenue sport athlete in an SEC program with tens of millions of dollars at stake. Is it a function of the sport, or does it involve simply the fact whether it's an athlete of, of any stripe? Well, I think in speaking to a number of people, I think there is a belief on college campuses that if an, ac if an allegation involves an athlete, that it's going to be much, much harder to, to get you know, j justice or to get due process for that allegation. But I, I do think we could peel back even further, and there's certainly the big money brand of college football, but there's also the big branding of colleges and universities in general with pursuing endowments and keeping up application rates. They also have to deal with how they're handling any accusation, the schools how are it brands, may negatively they affect their brand. The schools are brands. And yeah, you're, they're, you're they're selling like, an image. Right, and, and in a the face. last 10 years. Yeah, and I think even regardless of the athletic departments, which we've spoken so much about how you know, those logos are brands, you look at the schools too, their brands, and especially mm -hmm. in the last 10 years, it's, it's exploded that financially the kind of money these universities can make and what they need to protect as well. And now you've worked inside a major uh, athletic department. They have, all schools now, the Title IX, and certainly stories like this will put it out there. What else, to your mind, is needed? We've got about 25 seconds. I really think there just needs to be a complete real overhaul of the structure in, inside these athletic departments because we've seen over the last 10 years we could rattle off so many scandals Is that, that happen have occurred realistically? within athletic departments. <laughs> I think, right, I think pretty soon we are going to see some sort of chain, massive change about the NCAA system. So I think it's possible until that happens, I'm not sure there's any one thing we could point at and say we need to do this. I mean, if you want one, mm. maybe maybe just better Title IX oversight, like an actual person who's making sure these athletic departments even have protocol on the books. Well, certainly college sports, the song lately has been a change is coming. Kate Fagan, ESPNW, thank you for your time. We appreciate it. Uh, ESPN.com, Paula Levine's extensive report. You can check there. Also, links to many other resources and documents and also to Kate's piece on ESPNW. We'll be right back.